nice prayer, a blessing on the farmers and for those that are moving into our state and into uh, into condos that we build in our backyards. <laughs> what a beautiful and thoughtful prayer. Um, let's talk. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't you tell us? Tell us what's coming up. Starting tomorrow at the theaters, and I don't know which theaters will be at, is a movie The Egg. And it takes place in just a Mormon town, and it's about the Nephites and the Mormon men. I'm not sure if it's, I mean, Mormon men. I'm not sure if it's those two. It, it looked like it was Captain Moroni, I, at least did. the trailer. It did, but then it looked like it was, I don't know. You'll have to see, but Spielberg will be playing there as long as there is a green word. Uh, so we'll see it at some point. It's a full length movie. It is a really long film. Just Google the word and you'll find the references. Unfortunately, it's a. Uh it's rated R for, for violence. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's not, I think it's going to be toned down. I hope it's good. I hope, and I hope, I appreciate every opportunity we have to, to uphold, uh, uphold good entertainment, wholesome entertainment. If we talk about the church in northern Missouri, this this is probably our most painful time in the history of our faith. But it was a, it was a very short window and a, and a time of, of significant optimism as well. And and there are, there are a couple big deals that I want to talk about today, even though this took place in such a, a short time period. Part of what's good for us to see is to see how all these things overlap. So I know the font is pretty small, but uh, uh, if I if I send out the slides and you want to look at this more closely, but what you see is uh, the Kirtland period of the church from kind of 33 to 37, what we've been talking about, the school of the prophets until Heber C. Kimball goes on his mission, the... Uh, the Quorum of the Twelve were organized. The Kirtland Temple is dedicated. Kind of at the beginning of that period here in pink was the Jackson County days. Do you see how small the Jackson County days are in comparison with, with the Kirtland? We're, we're kind of living simultaneously. And after we leave ja Jackson County, we, we have our Clay County days, which includes Zion Camp. And our, our time as refugees in Clay County, which there's just not a lot, ton of church history about what was going on for us in Clay County. We were just living as refugees and building farms and, and working on other people's property. Meanwhile, life goes on in Kirtland, including the, the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. About the time the Kirtland Temple was dedicated, uh, an arrangement was made with the government of the state of Missouri to create a, uh, a new county, a, a county that could be exclusively for, for the Latter-day Saints. And so Caldwell County was created, and Latter-day Saints started moving to far west. Um, then eventually Joseph Smith would move to far west at the end of the Kirtland period, but kind of also at the end of the far west period. And then uh, eventually we will be expelled by, by November of 1838. So really our, our time as a whole church in, in far west was a pretty limited time, not even a full year that, that we were there. And at the end of that is Joseph Smith's time in Liberty Jail and the Saints moving to, uh, to Nauvoo. Here's what the, the state looked like in 1838. <coughs> it's just cool that somebody had this map printed at the time. You can see these northern counties, these southern counties, were just pretty much uninhabited in 1838. Missouri had been a state since 1820, but settlements were, were really, as you can imagine, along the Mississippi River, including St. Louis, and along the uh, Missouri River was still pretty frontier 
getting out to what is now Kansas City there in, uh, in Jackson County. So there's Jackson County where, where we started and thought we were going to have a homeland. Uh, there's Clay County just across the border where we had, had moved as refugees. And then there are the two new counties, Caldwell and Davies County, cut out of what was just Gray County, which went all the way to the Iowa border. And, and mostly Caldwell County was supposed to be for us. Davies County was, was, had settlers already in the town of Gallatin. And so, you know, we really weren't supposed to go there. Eventually we will, and we'll make a town in Adam on Diamond. But our hometown, our county, was going to be Caldwell County. And we moved into Far West. Oh, there's Far West. There's Adam on Diamond, Hans Mill. Uh, there's DeWitt. We, we had a little community start in DeWitt because it was a good idea for us to have a, uh, a, a riverboat access, uh, you know, for the economy and such. But those were, that was our community. Uh, on December of 1837, Brigham Young is chased out of Kirtland by his enemies. And his enemies come, uh, as we talked about the Kirtland apostasy, his enemies were some members of his own quorum because he stood up so deliberately for Joseph Smith. Brigham Young is even chased out before Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon are forced to escape. They leave Missouri uh, kind of in the, in the cloak of night, or leave Kirtland for Missouri, Emma and the families join them along the way. <coughs> I didn't have a picture of moving into Kirtland or into Missouri, so I, I took this picture of leaving Missouri and I flipped it. <laughs> it, it. It won't be till July of 38 when Hiram Smith and the seven presidents of the 70 will organize the mass migration of the Saints, 515 people from Kirtland they will leave in July and not get there till October, which you see them arriving on the 2nd of October, 1838. By October 30th, 1838, they're still living in covered wagons along the ridge of Shoal Creek when Hans Mill will be attacked. That, that's within uh, 20 days of them getting too far west is when the, uh, the hostilities break out. So that, uh, that's interesting. I, I but, Kurt, uh, Kurt yeah. they left Kirtland not because of non-member mobs, but because of their enemies from within the church. Yeah, yeah, and which started because of the economic distress, right? Right. When the economy collapsed and, and property holders and, and property was seized. And so it, it wasn't a, a mob that chased them out. But it was, it was antagonists driven by economics. Is that fair yeah. to explain yeah. that? Here's, here was the plat for Far West. It was surveyed as a four mile square. The popu population would eventually reach 5,000 in Far West with another 5,000 in, in farming communities, including, uh, for example, Hans Mill. But one of my interesting points I'll, I, I like to think about on this one is that Brigham Young will settle out of town. Brigham Young will start a, a little farm outside of Far West. And so when all the hostilities happen and, and the antagonists go after the leaders of the church, they take Joseph and Hiram and Sidney Rigdon and Harding D. Pratt. They take all those people that they saw as the leaders of the church. And they leave, they leave Heber C. Kimball because he's in England and nobody knows about where he's at. And they leave Brigham Young because he just happens to be out of town. And, and it's, it is because of those two that the exodus from, from Missouri is able to be organized. And we'll talk more about that later on. But by 38, they had four dry goods stores, six blacksmiths, two hotels, a printing shop, printing a weekly newspaper, and this one we called the Elder's Journal. We had a large schoolhouse. We had every expectation of staying. And uh, the, the uh, Elder's Journal wrote in July, the saints here 
are at perfect peace with all the surrounding inhabitants, and persecution is not so much as once named among them. Um, that's that. That's an optimism that that uh, we we only have to look a few months into the future to know how bad things are going to get by by October. <coughs> and I just like this painting by uh, by Kurt Harmon about Far West. Just imagining it as just a uh, an overnight kind of town, you know, is just just built up <laughs> from from nothing, like. Uh, like Eagle Mountain. <laughs> Once there was a desert, and now there's a Walmart. <laughs> but the, the community was, uh, you know, a sound community. Joseph arrives in, 18, in July, and when Joseph Smith arrives, we get some fairly interesting and significant revelations from 113 to 120 of the Doctrine and Covenants are re revealed in Far West including uh, a few that I want to emphasize. A mission calling for David Patton, uh, the second member of the Quorum of the Twelve, a revelation about the name of the church and the instructions to build a temple, and a, uh, a revelation on tithing. To, to work backwards on those, the revelation on tithing <coughs> is worth noting in, in July of 1838 because a, a change has taken place in the idea of church economics. We've examined this previously as the idea of the law of consecration and stewardship had been introduced to the saints in Jackson County and in Kirtland, but with, uh, with the application of, of property and goods and money, uh, the Lord gave them the instruction to just pay one tenth of their increase annually, rather than annually giving everything and getting everything back, right? You just kind of, by tithing, I, I really do uh, cringe when I hear tithing presented as the, the second tier commandment. Because we failed at consecration, the Lord gave us tithing. That's, that's, that's not true for anybody who pays their tithing and does feel pretty consecrated about that to this very day, right? We just, we just did what had been done already in Kirtland and in Jackson County and consecrated a tenth of our increase as well as a, a generous offering. I'll, we'll talk about the other two as we go through the, the slides. But... Uh, in section 115, the Lord said, and thus shall my church be called. That's the, the uh, revelation that President Nelson has focused on for us. We have been called the Church of Christ, the Church of Christ in the Latter Days, the Church of the Latter Day Saints, and the Church of the Mormonites. All those things have been part of our, our official communication, although nobody had ever written it on, on documents. But but if you remember the the uh, the logo on the top of the Kirtland Temple says, from the Church of the Latter-day Saints, right? Um, and then the Lord said, the Lord said, thus shall my church be called. The church that he has a covenant relationship with, the, the, the church that he is bound to, belongs to him. And then he tells them to, to build a temple. The slide here is a picture of the Far West Temple spot. If, if anybody's traveled there, it is one of my favorite places of church history to visit for, for a couple of reasons, for the feeling of optimism, for the tranquility of just, just being out. It is literally just a mowed lawn in the middle of cornfields. And uh, when you're in Jackson County, even though we can go to the temple site and, and we can feel a little bit of that pristine history, you're still surrounded by the greater Kansas City metropolis. When, when I was there with, uh, with my nephews, as we drove along the roads, one of my nephews just kept look, you know, looking at the blight and, the, and the, the rundown of buildings and the old businesses, and he just kept saying, oh, I'm so glad we don't live here anymore. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad we don't live here. And it, it is true, but uh, you, go, you go to Far West and you just kind of still feel like, I can live here. This would be all right. Uh, there are also, there are also uh, 
no visitor centers, and while there are missionaries, they keep the bathrooms clean and mow the lawns. They are not there to tell you the story of Mormonism. So, so you get to Far West, and you just you just have to feel it, and and I I believe you you do. So, uh, so if we is it owned by the that that little piece of property is owned by the church. So this this is harder to see, but here's from space. This this is what the church owns right here. Um, but this this was all of Far West, right? Joseph Smith's home was about here. Hiram Smith's home was out here, and there was a, a cemetery still here on this corner, which unfortunately is non-extant. The headstones are gone. The uh, the graves, uh, I suppose somebody could, you know, use uh, use that, the ground technology and find where the graves have been disturbed. We do have have some saints there that we love that are that are buried, but uh, you just wouldn't know there's a, a cemetery there at all. Here's our property with just a bathroom, a driveway, and the temple spot. Hey, at least there's a bathroom around here. Maybe I'll be here with Jazz one day. Just, just the lot. Just the field and just mm -hmm. folks, you know. And, and the bathroom, the bathroom is delightful. <laughs> <laughs> it flushes and everything. These, this, this is a, uh, a chapel, a, a meeting hall, house for our cousins from the community of Christ. So, so they still own a piece of property, property there too. But uh, look at so look at what the Lord says in section 115. Let the city far west be a holy and a, and consecrated land unto me, and it shall be called most holy, for the ground upon which thou standest is holy. Therefore, I command you to build a house unto me for the gathering together of my saints, that they may worship me. And let there be a beginning of this work and a foundation and a preparatory work this following summer. And let the beginning be made on the fourth day of July next. And from that time forth, let my people labor diligently to build a house unto my name. And in, and in one year from this day, let them recommence laying the foundation of my house. Thus, let them from that time forth labor diligently until it shall be finished. From the cornerstone thereof until the top thereof, <laughs> until that there shall not anything remain that is not finished. Um, I've got a couple points I want to make out of this verse, but is there anything, anything that interests you that you would, you would comment on? for a temple that's never going to be built. We've got we to gotta dig that one out. I, I find it interesting that the foundation will be laid down and then you wait for the <coughs> and start after the snowmelt to finish the temple. Because it probably, by the time the snow begins, the outside stuff will be done and it can be built. The Lord has a strategy for this, right? I like how consistent it is with what he had told me for Ames, that it is a house unto my name, and it is my house. <coughs> and why should you build it? So you can worship. That they may worship, right? Um, I also, the ground is holy. But what is it that made the ground holy? Because if, you know, why, why are they holy cornfields right now that yield uh, more than normal cornfields? I, I hope that we've examined and understand the point that it's 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 not the turf that makes the people holy, it's the people that make the, the, the ground holy. Right? What made the ground upon which thou standest holy? The latter day saints. <coughs> the gathering of people pursuing holiness. Uh, as I am wont to say. It's not the hat that makes the folk cool. It's the folk that makes the hat cool. <laughs> right? Therefore, I command you to build a house for the gathering that they may worship. Those are the purposes. Building the house of the Lord is for us to worship and for us to gather. That doctrine still, still carry, carries with us. And 
the instruction that this this was to be done the following summer and it and is to be done uh, in a year you in one year from this date get started April 26 1838 uh, we've talked more about this as this comes into our into line with our history but you know next April April 26 1839 we will already be out of Missouri and Brigham Young and a handful of the members of the Quorum of the Twelve will go back to this spot. They will go back to this spot and they will move a stone so that the prophecy may be fulfilled in a place that we had already left, in a place that they knew that we were not going to be able to labor from that time to uh, from, from the cornerstone to the top till there's nothing remain that is unfinished. But he wanted to make sure that we got started there. And, and he did. April 26, 1839, Brigham Young was there and dedicated that spot. Um, but for, for our uh, information's sake, uh, boy, I don't know why my picture vanished, but th th that was what the Kirtland Temple size-wise kind of fit, 59 by 79. The Jackson County Temple My pictures aren't showing up. The Jackson County Temple, you, we, we've examined, is about the same size. This made sense to us when we talked about the, the purpose of the Jackson County Temple and the purpose of the Kirtland Temple were, were about the same, right? They were built as meeting houses and administrative places and, and with limited ordinance. We did not know the ordinance of baptism for the dead. We did not know the ordinance of the endowment or the or ordinance of sealing families together. We just had had what they called the Kirtland endowment of, of washings and anointings and sealings. And I suspect if the Jackson County Temple had been built, that's what we would have done there. The Far West Temple was significantly larger uh, in its footprint. slides are doing this weird thing. I do because I built them this way, but I don't know why I do that. It is absolutely that. So, so there's how those temples would have compared side by side, top to bottom. Now, look at that. If the, if the far west temple had been built, its footprint, and I don't know how many floors there, there would have been an expectation to build, but its footprint would have been about the size of the, uh, of the Nauvoo Temple. So from Jackson County to Kirtland, we would have had a similar size. From far west to Nauvoo, we have a similar size. And then of course the, the, the granddaddy of all of us is the Salt Lake. But one might hypothesize, just complete wild speculation, that the instructions to build the far west temple with those parameters weren't just to have a bigger building than what we had built in Kirtland, I present to you the idea that the Lord had an anticipation that this temple would be built and that the saints would learn the ordinances of the endowment and of proxy baptism and, and of sealings. I think, I think that was the expectation. Now, this is, this is complicated theology, and you know that. There's the cornerstone that, the, that Brigham Young and the Twelve laid with, with protective glass over it because the Latter-day Saints cannot keep ourselves from chipping away at special <laughs> things. <laughs> Everybody wanted to take home a little piece of the temple. And, uh, yeah. The Lord's instruction to, to get working on the temple in April 39, even though the Saints would be expelled, from Missouri in October of 38. And uh, the theology that, that I ponder on this is the idea of conditional prophecy. It is hard, it is hard to wrap our brains around the idea of what Heavenly Father knows, what Heavenly Father wills, and the agency of humanity. It's hard to say 
I choose between right and wrong. I choose whether I will go to the freeway and turn to Tremonton or turn to Ogden. That's my choice. And then somebody else says, oh no, Heavenly Father knows you're going to go to Tremonton. Then I, then I guess I can't choose Ogden? What if I fake him out? <laughs> no, he knows everything. <laughs> there has to be a way. There has to be a way that Heavenly Father knows what happens if I turn to Ogden and what happens if I turn toward Tremont. <coughs> I, I think he has to also know if I just uh, forget the freeway altogether and head to Manaway <coughs> or, or drive my car out into Willard Bay. I think all of those options have to exist as legitimate possibilities or else Heavenly Father is tricking us. Right? If he told them to build a building that he knew they would not be able to build, then he's tricking them. How do you have to give them hope? He does give us, he does give us hope. But I think when he gives us hope, the hope is legitimate. Otherwise, and, and otherwise, <laughs> Heavenly Father becomes so uncomfortable. a trickster <laughs> deity. And, and trickster, trickster yeah. deities exist in almost every mythological culture. The idea that there is a there is a God who is messing with you, right? You that you just you just can't trust that you're going to win a war. Because even though you've got Athena on your side, uh, uh, Poseidon is messing with you. Or, or you just, you're not going to be able to, to have a happy life because Loki is messing with you. Or you, you, uh, you lay your air, bow and arrow down and you come back to find it and it's not there because Coyote is messing with you. All these trickster deities. But that idea of a trickster deity, or the idea that Heavenly Father is messing with us, in any account, compromises our faith in Him. For our faith in Him to be absolute, we have to absolutely trust that He is a God of truth and cannot lie, as, a, as an aspect of His personality. So when He says, build a temple here, starting next year, He's not lying. He's not tricking them, and he's not trying to give them false hope. He is telling them to build a temple here because, because if, if everything goes right, they will build a temple there. And if they build a temple there, they will, they will learn the ordinances that will be reserved for Nauvoo. If, if, they, if everything goes right. Now, about things not going right. Here's a line from one of my top five favorite movies. John Wayne's Big Jake. <laughs> and he's holding the he's holding the gun on the bad guy, and he says uh, something like, Well, I don't know what happens next. Your fault, my fault, nobody's fault. I'm gonna blow your head off. Right? Does that sound at all familiar? No. Well, then we're going to watch Big Jake. <laughs> <laughs> Things go wrong. Things go stupendously wrong. And I think that's part of the plan of salvation, is for us to be on this planet and learn that things can go wrong. I was just going to say that. The very plan of salvation is based on the same principle. Right? We have this amazing destiny that's way out before us. I really quick, I helped a friend who's with a church and she's from Georgia and Baptist or whatever, got baptized, went through the temple, got her patriarchal blessing, and it says she's had these amazing promises of how she's going to lead the church and all this. Well, she left the church three months later, right? Because she'd been chased. And so I thought, well, Heavenly Father, where were all of these plans for her that were laid out in the patriarchal blessing that I got to go and hear, you know, and he just kind of told me, yeah, but she has. She could have, but she had her choice. Same thing in Far West. There were people that made poor choices, which caused chaos. 
people have kids. They could have been. But people have kids. Women have kids, right? What happens? What happens when things go wrong? What happens when things go stupendously wrong when you're dealing with Heavenly Father and His plan? The works and the purposes and the designs of God cannot be frustrated, neither can they be brought to naught, he told Joseph Smith after he lost manuscript pages. He always has a plan. He always has a plan. It's not just that he knows what happens if I drive to Ogden. He knows what happens if I drive to Tremont. And even for your friend who maybe chose to go to Ogden, and I'm deliberately choosing Ogden to represent evil, um, it, only gets, it only gets worse as you go south. There's Weaver County, Davis County, Salt Lake, and then Mexico. In, in my mind, that, uh, that's all there is. We, uh, even, even when we turn and go to Ogden, there's a plan. There's a plan for how we fix it. There's a plan for how we fix that drive. There's a plan for, for going to Ogden. Um, I just, I can't explain time. I don't get it. But I do understand that our Heavenly Father, who knows the end from the beginning, has to know all the ends, all the possible ends. Um, and I could go back into more Loki to talk about time and <coughs> your seal, but no, let's get that. Because here's the other part. Oh, Josie had a last point. No, I was just, um, <coughs> I just keep thinking about hope um, because it's not going to be a lot of consumer sales going on. <laughs> I have wondered, I have a friend down there. <coughs> and mid-single adults and the idea of the one and only the, the, the idea of the one and only is based on an idea that leads us to an, uh, uh, a God who is a trickster and that is not our Heavenly Father see one of the great things we do is we start with what we understand about Heavenly Father he is a God of truth and cannot lie and then we go into this and it changes the way we feel about things including what you know John Boynton, uh, Luke Johnson, Lyman Johnson, and William McClellan were called to be members of the Quorum of the Twelve so that they could carry off this dispensation, right? There was a way that those four men could be apostles through the end of their days. But when they chose to leave the church, what did the Lord do? The Lord did what every good coach does when your when your uh, linebacker gets knocked out goes to the bench, gets another linebacker, and throws him into the game. And when you go to your bench, and on your bench you find John Taylor, John Page, Wilfred Woodruff, and Willard Richards, the backup plan is actually a better plan. Maybe. I don't, I don't know, and it's not worth our speculating, what would have become of, of a great man like John Taylor if William McClellan had never left the church. Maybe John Taylor would have come in when David Patton dies. Or maybe John Taylor would have come in when Joseph Smith dies and the first presidency is reorganized. Or maybe John Taylor would have still been an exalted being as a really good ministering brother, doing the thing that God wanted him to do, 
and and all of us would have been happily ever after, and we would never never worried about it. Um, so my kids watch Disney scripted videos on their nerd week on Disney, and the video they made where all the Hannah is running off of Vincent was reminding them, even though Avis, the the woman <laughs> sister <laughs> whose dad had a vision who she kind of kept her face all the time when she goes to Disney, yay! The line in the video that obviously it's a stock car show that was not mm-hmm. at this time was says, "Wow, so I was preparing y- you for me before I even knew something would have sense." And she said, "If you hadn't been such a good listener to me, well, it's not too bad of a short story." <laughs> <laughs> it is. Not only does Josie's point take a burden off our shoulders about. Did I lose my chance, or have I lost my children, or have I, uh, you know, should I have taken this transfer? What would have happened to my career, or blah, blah, blah. None of that matters. None of that is worth contemplating. Are, are you a backup? Is there a backup for you? Yes and yes, right? The works of God continue and continue, and the the infinite number of possibilities lead us to understand that the only thing we have to worry about right now is right now. Whatever path I am on, I repent daily and I make the next decision and it will lead me, it will lead me to immortality and eternal life. Amen, amen, amen. That, that is a God that we can have faith in. Our Heavenly Father, who is leading us to salvation, not who is messing with us. Including his instructions for these 12 to leave from the temple site, right? They're going to be gone. They, they in fact, will leave from that temple site. And uh, and bless your teenager. There is still there is still a path to immortality and eternal life. Because of this, we have infinite hope. Because there are infinite possibilities. When we start when we start trying to put everything in one singular timeline, Josie, it, it freaks us out, keeps us up at night, and gives us worry lines. And. Uh, that's just not worth it. <laughs> These good men will leave the church. Only one of them will come back. Luke Johnson will come back, be part of Brigham Young's uh, travel company uh, in 1847 into the valley. He drives a <coughs> boat. He drives a boat across the plains. They put a boat on wheels. They called it the revenue cutter, and he drove it. And when they'd get to a river they couldn't ford, He would haul everybody across. They left him in Casper. uh, And so we know that he has paid the price for his sins. (laughs) They left him in Casper to ferry people across the Platte River. Uh, Eventually, when he gets to Utah, he will be the Bishop of Tooele. And thus we know he is. (laughs) I was born in Tooele. Brother Johnson is a, is a good soul, and he proves our point, right? His, his life as a wagon driver and as a bishop is no less valuable in the kingdom of God than if he had stayed as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve. And him leaving the Quorum of the Twelve wasn't the only way that John Taylor could come into the Quorum of the Twelve. It was just, it was just part of soup. What if Lyman Johnson hadn't become greedy? He writes back to the saints, 
If I could believe Mormonism as I did when I traveled with you and preached, if I could possess the world, I would give it. I would give anything. I would suffer my right hand to be cut off. If I could believe it again, then I was full of joy and gladness. My dreams were pleasant. When I woke in the morning, my spirit was cheerful. I was happy by day and by night, full of peace and joy and thanksgiving. But now it is darkness, pain, sorrow, misery in the extreme. I have never since seen a, seen a happy moment. Was Brother Johnson's problem there? If we could type diagnose for him, we would say, Lyman, turn around. Belief isn't something that happens to you, Lyman. Belief is a choice you make. If I could believe in Mormonism as I did, yes, you can. Yes, you can. But you're not going to start from darkness, staring into the darkness and to believe. You start to believe when you turn your back on darkness and see the sun. Right? Yes, ma'am. somebody, blame automotive engineering. <laughs> blame science. <laughs> if, if, he gets sick, if he gets sick, it is just biology. Biology! It's not, it's not God. Right? He's got, there's a plan for you to have not touched that doorknob. What if, uh, hey, Lynette? So I was with you in a very profound moment. You were ministering to a woman who had just lost her husband to COVID and he had he, he had fought for months and months going up and down the word had fasted, the church had fasted everyone thought things were going to be good and then at the very end he got pneumonia and died and all of their faith had come, they were thinking that it was going to be okay and, and I remember you saying so how are you and she said I'm mad at God and you said, if you're mad at anything, be mad at God's mercy, because God's going to be the one who gets you through this. It was powerful. Our, our, our king, our deliverer, our all, is not our Loki. If I could get a tattoo, I would say that. <laughs> <laughs> and also goat cheese. <laughs> Carol. Just amazed and, and, and stuck on this statement that he makes. And mostly, it, I want to reflect, I want to self reflect and say, where in my life is, is something my own choosing? Um, instead of just saying, oh, look at him, I wish he would have turned around. <coughs> Learn from it. Wh where am I maybe a little bit darker or have sorrow or misery? Um, and and we do we it's not God's fault that you didn't put gas in it's it's our fault right I got to remember to put gas in oh, I mean just me for just her. our <laughs> own our <laughs> own no. but but we all just go so busy with our lives that we don't get every single thing done are we is there a place that I just haven't gotten everything done or been overwhelmed or and, and I want to make sure that I don't find myself one day having lost peace and joy and thanksgiving. I want to make sure that, make sure I'm looking to God, make sure I'm looking to the light, dealing with 
life at the same time, but uh, I don't want I don't want to slide like that. That is the life. principle of daily repentance. Right? Every day making those tweaks to correct our decisions. W.W. Mm -hmm. Phelps leaves. He's one of the counselors in the state presidency of Missouri, and, and he gets his feelings hurt, along with David and John Whitmer, the other members of the presidency. They get their feelings hurt, by the way, um, I think in a power play. They've been the bosses, and all of a sudden, Thomas Marsh, David Patton, and Brigham Young show up, the three ranking members of the Quorum of the Twelve, and they, and they uh, usurp them. And those three, the, the guys who had been in charge, get their feelings hurt. Oh, how often we get our feelings hurt over a power play. But <coughs> can we just come back? Remember what Joseph Smith wrote to David or to William Phelps? Come on, dear brother, since the war is past, for friends at first are friends again at last. Brother Phelps does come back, and even though he had such hostile feelings to Joseph Smith in uh, in July of of thirty eight, by June of forty four he is writing praise to the man who can rule with Jehovah. Jesus anointed that prophet. There is a path for Brother Phelps. What if, what if Oliver Cowdery would have had a better memory? <laughs> Only a minute ago, Oliver Cowdery had stood on the pulpits of the Kirtland Temple, right? He had been there. He knows what John the Baptist's voice sounds like. The Quorum of the Twelve write to him. Uh, Joseph instructed the Twelve to write. Write to Oliver Cowdery and ask him if he has not eaten husks long enough. Isn't that a great line? Boy, but I would hate to say it to anybody. <laughs> but it's kind of the prodigal, right? Mm -hmm. are, you, are you done being the prodigal, Oliver? Joseph even suggested that Oliver might accompany Orson Hyde of his mission to Jerusalem to dedicate the land. Welcome back, Oliver. Right? Welcome back. I put you right back where, where you can be trusted. In response to the request of the Twelve in, uh, in Nauvoo, a draft of the er, Blah, blah, they draft a letter. Your brethren are ready to receive you. We are not your enemies, but your brethren. Your dwelling place ought to be in Zion. Your labor might be needed in Jerusalem, and you ought to be the servant of the living God. Oliver wrote back saying that he had no unkindly feelings toward the twelve. And acknowledged his isolation. It had been a long time, nearly six years, the winds and waves, floods and storms had been arrayed to oppose me. He won't come back. He won't come back until 1848, where he will be baptized in, uh, in winter quarters by his brother-in-law, um, Joseph Young. What if Thomas B. Marsh, the president of the Quorum of the Twelve, had been humbled? Normally, most of us know the story or the idea of the milk strippings and his pride. It's, it's a story that George A. Smith will tell years later that uh, sister, sister Marsh and another sister had a change where they would each milk for a day and give both the milk from both cows to one family and then the family would take the next. But that uh, sister Marsh accused th this other sister, a sister Harris, of, of keeping the strippings, the last, the last milk left in, in the cow. You know, she, she milked the cow gave the jug and then went back and, and talk, talked it off and kept a little for herself. And, uh, and so she got mad at her. So they took her to the, uh, the, she took her to court. And the court she took her to was the teacher's quorum court, which I, I, is, is great, right? Because if you look at section 20, the teachers have a responsibility to see that there is no iniquity or backbiting among the saints. But the teachers were also not 13 year olds. <laughs> But they rule against they rule against her against sister sister Marsh. Thomas is feeling to her because how dare you? I'm president of the dang quorum of the twelve. So he takes it to the next level and goes to the bishop, and the bishop, you know, upholds the appeal. So he takes it to the first presidency. And before the court before the trial is even given, Joseph 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 says, "Don't don't bring this up. Don't don't press this charge. Don't make the first presidency rule on." basically. 
Thomas presses and presses and presses and finds against him, and his feelings are hurt, and he leaves. He will be visited by a friend. I'm going to tell you about that angelic visit next week. And he will eventually come back. But in the theme of our class, what if Thomas Marsh had been Humphrey? He's the president of the Quorum of the Twelve. He's the president of the Quorum of the Twelve, and knowing what God knows, in the infinite world of possibilities, heaven forbid something happened to Joseph Smith, Thomas B. Marsh would become the, uh, the successor in his presidency, right? Well, we do know that something would happen to Joseph Smith in June of 1844. But before any of that was happening, Look at what the Lord blessed on Thomas Marsh in section 112. Therefore, gird up thy loins for the work. Let thy feet be shod also, for thou art chosen. Get this little bit out of the patriarchal blessing. And thy path flieth among the mountains and among many nations. He didn't get to go uh, to England with Heber C. Kimball, right? right. right? Yeah. Little does he know, but in section 100, by, by time section 112 is given, everybody knows, well, the Lord knows, that the whole Quorum of the Twelve will be sent to England, where Brigham Young will be the mission president as president of the Quorum, where he could have been among the many nations. He's, in fact, even promised in section 112 that... Uh, that both the Jews and the Gentiles would hear his voice. I think there was a timeline where Thomas B. Marsh was going to take the gospel to, to Europe and administer the gospel to Denmark and to Spain and, and <coughs> that he would have gone with, with Orson Hyde to Jerusalem. But most significantly in this context, thy path lieth lieth among the mountains. Thomas B. Marsh, patriarchal blessing, I believe, is telling him, you stay true and faithful, and you're going to take the saints to the valleys of the everlasting hills. You're going to take the saints to Utah. But Thomas B. Marsh does not stay faithful. So does that mean that Joseph Smith won't have a successor? That's ridiculous. That will his successor do? He will take them to the mountains, and he will be the instrument for taking the gospel to many nations? And when the Lord goes to his bullpen and is able to dig up Brigham Young, you, you got to know that the way it works and the purposes and the designs of God cannot be frustrated, neither, neither will they be brought to naught. Everything, everything will work out. Everything will work out. And when it's done, it will work out in the best way that our agency will have allowed. Eventually, Brother Marsh comes back. And he's in the tabernacle in Salt Lake City, and Brigham Young <coughs> invites him to the stand to speak. And Brother Marsh says, I want your fellowship. I want your God to be my God. I want to live with you forever in time and eternity. I never want to forsake the people of God anymore. I want to have your confidence. I want to be one in the house of God. I, I have learned to understand what David said when he exclaimed, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in the tents of the wickedness. I have not come here to seek for any office except it be to be a doorkeeper or a deacon. No, I'm neither worthy nor fit, but I want a place among you as a humble servant of God. Welcome back, Tommy. Then Brigham Young gets up and ribs him. By the way, I told this story one time and Carol used to me who made Brigham Young look bad. Brigham Young was a jokester. I think we just don't understand his dark sense of humor. It's the truth. Also, he could be a little bit of a jerk. He gets up and he says, hey, look at Thomas B. Marsh. He and I used to be in the Quorum of the Twelve together. In fact, he was my senior because he, he's a, a year and two months older than me. Look at him. Does he look like he's only a year older than me? Look at me. Look at him. Look at me. That's what apostasy does to you. Suck the soul out of you. And Thomas said, that's why I left Brigham. <laughs> Our time spent, we will have to save for next week our conversation on Adam on Diomed. 
but I am I am beyond persuaded <coughs> that Heavenly Father has plans, that he sees the end from the beginning, that he sees all possible scenarios <coughs> that our agency will allow, and that we are free to choose immortality and eternal life according to the plan of the great creator. And we can choose it, and our children can choose it, and our neighbors can choose it at any moment on, on their trajectory. <coughs> any place, any time, Thomas P. Marsh can come back. And when he does, we'll let him speak in the data lab on it. We all know Thomas Marsh's. For heaven's sakes, I've been Thomas P. Marsh. Not, you know, can't leave the church, but I got mad at Brown Young one time. <laughs> I'm I'm just grateful to be in the game. I'll be a tent, uh, a, a doorkeeper in, in the house of the Lord, a deacon, or anybody, because I just want to be part of the saints. I want to have their confidence. I want to be one in the house of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. of our stewardship so that you follow and thy lead as we go throughout our life. We are so grateful for you and we love you very much. We say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you everybody.